Um, for those of you who haven't read the book, I'm not spoiling anything because this happens. Uh, you can read about this in the uh, on the you know whatever it's called. Yeah, exactly on the jacket. Um, so Josh goes to the U.S. Memory Championships as a reporter, and then the next year enters it and wins. <laughs> and he describes, he describes this moment as uh, the moment that you won, you describe as being totally overwhelmed and kind of having your hand in your, your head in your hands, uh, and that it might have looked to the audience like you were overwhelmed with joy, but really it was just complete exhaustion. That's true, yeah. <laughs> but what I want to know is, wasn't there like any part of you that was thinking, oh my god, my book has a great ending now. Do you know what's so <laughs> funny is actually the emotion that was running through my, my head or at that moment in time was, oh crap, my book is ruined. What? Yeah, no. How could that be? Because, okay, so I need to explain that I had in mind that I was going to be telling this story about this bizarre world of people who get together on the weekends and compete right. to you know, see how much they can remember yeah. this universe of nerds. Total. And now I was the king of the nerds. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, you are. And, but <laughs> in all seriousness, thank you. In all seriousness, as a journalist, this was a problem. I thought I would compete in this contest and it would be like a funny afterword to the story. And all of the reporting that I had done was structured around telling the story of these other characters. And once I won the contest, this was clearly going to have to be a different book. And it actually posed all sorts of writing challenges in that the reporting I did wasn't really suited for the story that I now had to tell. Okay, so did you, because to me, it seems like that completes the arc of the book, or maybe that's because that's the book I read. Oh, that's it, would have been a, it wouldn't have been a very good book. <laughs> I mean, so did you have to go back and reconnoiter everything? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, to, just to give you the basic backstory here, yeah. I had gone to cover this contest uh, as a reporter for Slate magazine to write like a little, you know, 1,200 word story. It was these people memorizing phone numbers and people's names and entire poems and packs of, cards. packs of playing cards, stuff that seemed totally superhuman. And I started talking to them, and they were like, no, 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 we're not savants, we're not freaks. Uh, we have trained ourselves to perform these feats of memory using ancient mnemonic techniques that were invented in Greece and perfected by the Romans. And I thought that was awesome and fascinating, and I wanted to write something longer about it. Um, and so I went and started going to these contests and covering them, thinking I was going to tell a story about this world and the science behind it and the history behind it. My competing was not part of the story until, the, until it became the story. Okay, so what was the, when did, what, what was the moment when you were like, yeah, okay, I, I gotta try that? Um, well, here's the problem with writing about a memory contest. <laughs> it's that they are pathologically boring events. Uh, <laughs> It is literally like a bunch of people taking the SAT, and <laughs> truly the most dramatic it gets is when somebody like starts massaging their temples. <laughs> and as a journalist, I'm sitting there with my notepad like, give me something to write about, because I know that inside these people's minds, there's this incredible thing going on, which is they are creating these fabulous stories, these fabulous pictures in their mind's eye to help them remember this information. And, uh, but I didn't have access to it. And so at a certain point I was like, you know, if I'm gonna tell, explain how this works, I've kinda gotta walk in their shoes a little bit. And, and that's how I started futzing around with this kind of in my basement, in my parents' basement, full disclosure. Um, <laughs> and then sort of one thing led to another, led to another, and before I knew it I was saying, you know, I might actually have a chance of winning this contest. I'm getting kind of good at it. But, and that's, that's what ended up happening. Okay, so, but, okay, you say that, um, you know, everybody thinks that they, that it takes something really special to do this kind of stuff, and you write in the beginning of the book that you have a completely average memory, that you are often forgetting the location of your car keys, the location of your car, 
True story. Uh, food in the oven, your girlfriend, now your wife's birthday. I hope you've mastered that one by now. Uh, Valentine's Day, your friend's phone numbers, and of course, putting down the toilet seat. Uh, Still working on that one. And yet, you won the US memory competition. So does that say more about you or about the competition? Seriously. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is actually a question that scientists have asked. Yeah, uh, like, well, the question was, these people who compete in these memory contests all profess to have average memories. And they claim that everything they're able to do is the result of training and technique. And a few years back, uh, some scientists, some psychologists at University College London brought a bunch of memory champions into the lab to test them. Is there something different about these human beings? And they gave them all sorts of cognitive tests, memory tests, um, IQ tests, and they found that basically there was nothing different about these people. Was there something different about their brains? The answer was structurally, anatomically, there was nothing different about their brains. There was one crucial difference between the memory champions and the control subjects that they compared them to. And that was when they put them in an fMRI chamber and scanned their brains while they were memorizing stuff, they were activating different regions of the brain than normal people. Here's the thing. The regions of the brain that they were activating involved visual and spatial memory. And that's because they were using a set of techniques that had been, as I said before, invented in ancient Greece 2,500 years ago for transforming whatever piece, kind of information you want to remember into a series of visual images in a sort of spatial layout in your mind's eye. It's a technique known as the memory palace. And anybody can learn it. It's actually fairly simple. And once you teach it to somebody and you stick them in an fMRI chamber, the, the same regions of their brain light up at this, uh, just like the memory champions. OK, so now, now we have to go back to fifth century BC. Because now you have to tell the story of exactly where this was born. And how people memorized before this, I have no idea, <laughs> since this is supposed to be the birth of the art of memory. Um, but you've got to tell that story. Well, the story, as it's passed down from Cicero, who wrote about it uh, in the first century BC, is that there was a poet, a Greek poet named Simonides. And Simonides was attending a banquet where he was the hired entertainment. Because back then, you went to a really slamming party, you didn't invite a DJ, you invited a poet. And uh, Simonides stands up, delivers this poem from memory, of course, walks out the door, and at that moment, the roof of the banquet hall collapses, and it kills everybody inside. Not only does it not only does it kill everybody, it, it mangles the bodies beyond all recognition. So nobody can say who was inside, who was sitting where. Nobody can be properly buried. And Simonides closes his eyes and has this realization, which is that in his mind's eye, he can see where each of the guests at the banquet had been sitting. And what he realized was, as bad as we are at remembering all sorts of things, there we're actually really good at remembering spatially. And if instead of it being the guests at the banquet sitting around the table, if it had been every great Greek dramatist sitting in the order in which they had, the year in which they had been born, he would have remembered that instead. Um, and so out of that realization came this technique known as the memory palace, which was subsequently used by Cicero to memorize his speeches, used by medieval scholars to memorize entire books, and then was kind of forgotten about, except for at this totally strange and bizarre contest called the US Memory Championships. So um, oh, we'll get to the Memory Palace in a minute. But um, you, you write that uh, once upon a time, memory was at the root of all culture. Um, can you explain exactly what you mean by that? Well, you know, before we had an alphabet, to write things down in, uh, before we had paper to write those letters on, or papyrus or parchment, things, anything that was going to be passed down from generation to generation had to be remembered. And you can imagine a culture in which everything that matters has to be remembered 
places an entirely different value on human memory as a you know, fundamental capacity of what we do. Uh, over time, we've invented a series of technologies, starting with the alphabet and moving all the way up to the Blackberry, I guess, that have essentially allowed us to outsource our memories externally. Uh, and that's changed how we think about and how we use our memories. And it's no longer imperative to remember in the way that people once had to. And people would memorize books, and scholars were really those that could, almost, that could memorize well, I, largely. I mean, of course, they were scholars intellectually, but they had to memorize the book. There were no libraries. There were no books. There, you know. as, as late as the 15th century, when Gutenberg came along, right. if you were a scholar consulting a text, Chances are, first of all, it was a text that took somebody, a book that took somebody months to write to, by hand. There were probably only a couple dozen copies of it in existence anywhere in the world. In all likelihood, they were chained to a lectern somewhere. The, if you were consulting a text, chances were you were never going to see it again. Uh, it was an extremely valuable object. There was an imperative to read it deeply and imprint it on your mind. Uh, it's a totally different form of reading than the kind of reading that we practice today, where we you know, read kind of superficially and read, read books once and then go on to the next thing and then totally forget uh, what the book was about. Uh, it's kind of amazing to think about, that, the totally different relationship yeah. to reading. And, and so, I mean, it kind of begs the question, uh, you know, with all of the things we offload our memory to all these devices, whether it's, you know, a you know, legal pad or a Blackberry, um, are our memories getting that much work as a result? And is there any need to memorize anything anymore? I mean, it gets to a greater cultural question. But really, what's the point if, we, if it's downloadable? It's a good question, and I actually think it's going to become an ever more crucial question over the next uh, decade, two decades. Yeah. Because right now, these devices that we have to store stuff are kind of clunky in the scheme of things. As great as the <laughs> iPhone 4S is, it's still kind of clunky if you think about it. I mean, if I have to consult it to grab a, a memory out of it, I still have to kind of you know, use my fingers or talk to it. Uh, but that bridge between our internal memories and our external memories is getting shorter and shorter and shorter, and that gap is closing. The question is, as that gap closes, why do we need to bother memorizing anything or learning anything? That's what when we say memorizing, I mean learning anything. Yeah. You can always just ask your iPhone. And I think that's going to be a dangerous temptation. It already is a dangerous temptation. And it's dangerous because as wonderful as the iPhone may be, iPhone has never invented anything. iPhone has never had an insight. iPhone has never uh, taken two ideas that didn't previously go together and create something new. That still requires a human mind. And a human mind requires raw material to work with. And if you're going to move through the world appreciating it, having an interesting experience of, the, uh, of life, you need to have a furnished mind. And I fear that we're going to look at all of the great benefits of these sorts of technologies and forget or not pay attention to the costs of this offloading. Or maybe, maybe the pendulum will swing the other way. Maybe. And we'll all become Amish? <laughs> yeah. well, I, I'm not, I, think it's, I, I think that you're going to see more and more people who, who are finding ways to uh, separate themselves because uh, they're recognizing this, that, that, that this kind of way of interacting with the world that is entirely mediated by technology. Because by the way, iPhone's a thing you hold in your hand. iPhone 20 is going to be a thing that you wear like a pair of glasses. Yeah. And it's really going to be mediating our experience of technology, of the world. Um, I think people are going to want to figure out ways to escape. Yeah. All right. So just jumping back into the memory palace for yeah. a second. Well, first. I want you to describe exactly what you looked like during the competition. <laughs> like, what were you adorned with? I was kind of short. <laughs> uh, Dark hair. Jewish, glasses. yeah. <laughs> um, no. little, little geeky looking. With, uh, with um, the things that people wear 
when they're trying right. to concentrate, is what I'm getting at. Okay, so in the sport of competitive memorizing, <laughs> were you laughing at sport? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the people who compete, by the way, call themselves mental athletes. Uh, so usually I put air quotes around that. All mental athletes compete wearing earmuffs. And typically they have earplugs underneath their earmuffs because you simply can never be deaf enough in a memory contest. It's all about concentration. If you're really into it, at the highest levels, uh, and this is almost exclusively in Germany, where they take this sport very seriously. There are state championships and uh, school championships and national championships. The German national memory champion is like a celebrity. He appears on TV. Women throw their panties at him. It's truly <laughs> bizarre. Uh, it speaks to something just deep in the Teutonic soul, this, this sport of memory. The German memory co champion competes wearing blinders. Uh, he actually, they're like sunglasses that have been totally masked out, except for two little holes, so that he can only look at what's directly in front of him. Uh, there's a guy from Denmark who competes wearing horse blinders. Uh, as if, like, off of a horse from Central Park. Um, but didn't you have some safety goggle? Uh, oh, yeah, well, I, this is participatory journalism. <laughs> I, yeah, but you're saying it like, oh, they are so weird. <laughs> like, I seem to remember yes, something so, about you being in your parents' basement with safety goggles on painted black. Yes, so I had my own equipment. Am I right? Well, I <laughs> wanted to learn how to do this properly. And when I went, after winning this U.S. Memory Championship, which really was not supposed to happen, I was in a very odd position of being this journalist who was now the official representative of the United States of America with the hopes and dreams of 290 million people <laughs> resting not lightly on my shoulders. And so I thought, okay, now I gotta step it up. This is not just like a little writing assignment. You know, Uncle Sam is counting on me. So I had a pair of earmuffs painted uh, with the stars and stripes <laughs> because I wanted them all to know who the Yankee in the room was. And I also had a pair of um, safety goggles that I custom made so that I would be able to focus like a German memory champion. Painted black. Painted black. With I, little pinholes? With, little, with teeny little holes, yeah. Yeah, see, he's not, you're not, not totally forthcoming when it well. comes to your own, uh, <laughs> but we'll let that slide. Um, so, can you explain to the audience, I've read the book so I know, but um, exactly like what a memory palace is and how you go about setting one up okay. mentally. And yeah, can you? So this is an, an extremely simple idea. And it might help them on their SATs. Uh, maybe. Um, can definitely help you with a grocery list. The simple idea is if you, Let's say you had to memorize a grocery list, for example. And what you would do is picture yourself at the front door of your house, a building that you know really, really well, that you have a great spatial memory of. And in front of the front door of your house, you'd imagine an image of whatever the first item on your shopping list is. Let's say it's milk. You wouldn't just imagine milk at the front door. You'd try and imagine the craziest, most bizarre, silly, potentially X-rated scene involving milk that you can possibly conjure. <laughs> and this is, I'm not kidding, this is old advice going back at least 2,000 years. If you want to make something memorable, the trick is to make it so unlike anything you've ever seen before that you can't forget it. And that means activating the parts of your imagination that kind of create memorable images. So there's a 15th century uh, writer on memory named Peter of Ravenna who says like the best trick for making stuff memorable involves sexy ladies. If you can do that, you'll make whatever it is memorable. So at the front door of your house, you saw sort of the most Angelina Jolie in a bikini or less being doused in milk. That would be memorable. <laughs> you would remember to pick up milk. And then if you walked in the front door of your house and you had to remember uh, to get tomatoes, Maybe you'd see somebody getting pelted with tomatoes, and you'd go to the next room in your house, and you'd see uh, bananas. I'll leave that one to your imagination. And you'd go like that through your house, seeing these images that are 
stinky, raunchy, weird, emotionally resonant. Uh, and then you'd find that when you show up at the supermarket and you walk through your house again, those images that you had created would still be there. That's the essence of the technique. And that is used in these memory contests to memorize thousands of random numbers in perfect order, uh, entire shuffled packs of playing cards in under a minute, uh, entire poems. Uh, there's a slightly different technique for remembering the names of strangers, but there's one event where they give you 99 headshots of strangers and their first and last names, and you have 15 minutes to memorize them. Um, yeah, daunting stuff, except it's not that hard to do, it turns out, if you sort of know how to do it and you practice. But also, like, how many structures do you have to have in your mind to place, you know, 10,000 numbers. I mean, a like, lot. What, what size house is this? It's like a metropolis, basically. <laughs> I mean, you need a lot of houses. You need to be uh, Mitt Romney, basically. Yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> and also, once, even like once you kind of picture every place you've ever lived and every school you've ever attended and your parents' house and the apartment of your best friend or whoever, then what, I, what kind of baffled me about it was the speed, because you know, the samples in the book, when you try and do it yourself and you walk through the house you grew up in or something, okay, you can do it, blah, 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 the milk, but you're like spending a lot of time creating these things. At the memory thing, you're putting them there in nanoseconds. So this is the real- How do you do that? You, you asked me how did I get sucked into this? Like why was I, I you, it makes sense, I wanted to see how it worked, I tried yeah. to do it myself. Why did I get like so obsessed with it that I ended up entering this contest? and winning it. The reason is, this is actually a lot of fun. Uh, because what you're training is not really your memory. Uh, what you're training is an ability to create totally crazy scenes in your mind's eye very, very quickly. OK, now I, I just have to ask you to read the very first paragraph of the book okay. as a perfect example of what you're talking about. Uh, so the, chapter one, <clears throat> Dom DeLuise, you remember him, celebrity fat man and five of clubs, has been implicated in the following unseemly acts in my mind's eye. He has hawked a fat globule of spittle, nine of clubs, on Albert Einstein's thick white mane, three of diamonds, and delivered a devastating karate kick, five of spades, to the groin of Pope Benedict the 16th, six of diamonds. Keep going. <laughs> oh, one or two more. Okay. Michael Jackson, the king of hearts, has engaged in behavior bizarre even for him. He has defecated, two of clubs, on a salmon, uh, salmon burger, king of clubs, and captured his flatulence, queen of clubs, in a balloon, six of spades. OK, so, <laughs> so that's what you're talking about in terms of creative images. Yeah, that's the sort of thing that you're <laughs> sort of trying to really pollute your brain with, exactly. Right, right. Um, so uh, these are um, examples of, not to get too detailed, but um, these are like PAOs, right? That, yes. Now, if okay. we don't need to get too deep into this. No, we'll, I know. We'll start geeking out up here. But. Right, no, but, but that's an, a, a person, action, object, in, in a way to remember cards more than one at a time. And that is a technique that goes back to the 14th century. I mean, all this stuff is really... Who knew? <laughs> well, it's all really, really old. And that's what's kind of remarkable, is that once upon a time, people invested in this idea of training their memories, of having a furnished mind uh, in a way that seems entirely alien to us today. Uh, and it reveals a lot about how much we've changed that we would never think of, no sane person would ever think of trying to do stuff like this uh, recreationally today. Uh, and yet, once upon a time, these sorts of memory techniques were not only widely known, but widely practiced. So this is kind of um, the simplest, and yet this is the most complex question I think I can ask. Because on the one hand, you think you know, but you don't really know. What exactly is a memory? Uh, I mean, when it comes to your brain, I mean, we all know what, what a memory is practically, but what is it a chemical? Is it a series of, you know, what is it? So what's really cool is <clears throat> you could ask that question of 
a historian. You could ask that question of a neuroscientist. You could ask that question of a psychologist. You could ask that question of a, of a sociologist. And you would get four completely different answers. And fundamentally, at the level of the neuron, we know what a memory is um, in a certain sense, mm -hmm. uh, at, like, a, like in a biochemical sense. Right. And yet, nobody's ever actually seen a memory in a human brain. We don't know, my memory of this event, we know that it's stored somehow in a pattern of a, a network of neurons in my brain that use different parts of the brain, but nobody actually can tell you what that pattern is. Um, and that's kind of remarkable, and that's one of the sort of big questions that I think we don't have the, the capacity to answer right now, but, but will be answered in the next however many decades. Um, it it, uh, it seems like all the memory techniques are basically taking information, I mean, to me, it seems like they're all taking information that the brain cannot comprehend and turning them into chunks of things that the brain can comprehend. That, the, you know, that a list of, you know, 40 things on a piece of paper, our brain goes, no way, but placed here and maybe goosed up with some interesting, dazzling, pyrotechnics in our brain, we can remember them, uh, placed specifically here and there. So I'm wondering what, what kind of implications that has for all kinds of learning. Because, I mean, if, you know, you could equate Gorbachev with Lady Gaga, you know, could all kids uh, learn Russian history more easily? I mean, the best teachers kind of do this naturally, make it more interesting. But I guess I'm kind of wondering what we have to learn from the memory palace kind of applied writ large. So you're right. The best teachers sort of intuitively yeah. do this. The best students intuitively do it. Um, and there are fundamental principles about how our memories work that are at play in why something like this is a more successful way to learn information for the long term. Not to say that students should be in schools, you know, learning U.S. history in memory palaces. No, right. but the principles behind why they work are things that should be taught to uh, students, in in my opinion. And it's not just the value of visual imagery. There are other principles from cognitive science that we know are effective that haven't sort of dripped down into the classroom yet. For example, one of the best known things about how memory works that we've known about for over a century is a principle called, uh, of, known as spaced repetition. The best way to learn information for the long term is to learn it, go away from it for a while, come back to it, go away from it for a while, come back to it. We know this, not just from lab studies, but from studies done in the wilds of the classroom. And yet, our entire system of teaching is typically set up in a manner that's antithetical to this principle. You learn information in a block, right? You have a block of 19th century US history, and then there's like a test at the end, and typically everybody crams for the test, and then they take the test, and then the next day, they can, they're allowed to basically forget everything they learned, and nobody ever, over the course of the rest of their education, comes back to make sure that that information has been secured for the long term. That's stupid. Like, we know that there are better ways to learn information, to learn cumulatively. Uh, and yet, that's not how we do it. Yeah. Um, but also, I guess I'm also wondering, you know, um, I, I, I particular, I actually have a very good memory for things that happened when I was young. And I know a lot of people, for instance, when it comes to high school, they, they can be, I remember so much about high school, so many people, so many things that happened. Um, and I know people who can barely remember where they went to high school, let alone what happened in high school. Sort of makes you wonder what the point is, right? <laughs> of high school? Of, 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 of school in general. I'm not, I'm not saying that facetiously. Huh. Like, it's actually profoundly strange that we all know it to be the case that we don't remember jack squat from the educations that either we or our parents or our government paid a ton of money for, 
uh, we don't remember them. So what's going on there? Like, really? <laughs> it's weird. And it's weird that it's not kind of a little bit scandalous. And I don't know what the answer is, but it, I think it suggests that we might be doing something kind of wrong <laughs> in how we convey information to the, convey knowledge to the next generation. And was there any, is there any, I guess, um, data if I can remember everything I did in high school and someone who I went to high school with has to call me to say, do I know that person? I'm like, you dated him. <laughs> you know, uh, seriously, I have a friend. I'm not exaggerating. And uh, I mean, does it mean that I have a better memory? Does it mean that it was more creative time for me so it just stuck in my brain? Do we all have the same capacity? Do just you means you mean? did less drugs. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably true. <laughs> but you know what I'm getting at. It's like, I mean, we, we all obviously have very different strengths and weaknesses in our brain, but do we all have the same capacity? I mean, you claim to have a very average memory, and yet you went all very far. But every, I'm just wondering, do you think, do, do we all have the same capacity to remember virtually anything? Um, so it's what you're asking about is, another kind of strange thing about memory, which is that some people remember some stuff really well and not other stuff. Right. Uh, and other people remember that other stuff really well and not whatever the other person remembers. Yeah. And that has to do with a fundamental feature of how our memories work, which is that we remember stuff that has context for us, that is interesting to us, that is meaningful, that we have a whole network of other things floating around in our memories that allow us to integrate the, that, that information, right? So I have a great memory for stuff revolving around baseball, because I love <laughs> baseball, and I care about baseball. Right. And when somebody tells me that, um, you know, whatever, Bryce Harper, uh, that's not going to be relevant to you guys, uh, <laughs> we're in Chicago, whatever. When somebody tells me some piece of information about baseball, I have a whole sort of network of associations that that piece of information suddenly um, fits, into? fits into. And it's therefore more likely to be remembered. Whereas for somebody who doesn't care about baseball, and there's actually a really great little study that shows this, uh, that demonstrated this. If you have that person sort of watch a baseball game and then ask, or they're, they're asked to recall it later, they end up telling you stuff about like the weather <laughs> and uh, you know, like the seventh inning stretch. <laughs> um, because that's the stuff that kind that of made an impression on them, yeah. Except that also, I mean, everybody remembers what they were doing when something earth-shattering happened. The Twin Towers, Kennedy dying, you know, uh, Martin Luther King's assassination, Princess Di dying. I mean, those things cement, I mean, even your example in the book say you remember exactly what you were eating for breakfast. You can't remember yesterday, but you can remember the day when you heard about the Twin Towers. Although, you know, it's funny with the, like, with the Twin Towers, yeah. uh, with 9-11, I think part of the reason that, that is memory uh, is so strong is because we've all repeated it so many times. How many times have you been in a conversation with somebody and you've, somehow it's come back to like what you were doing on 9-11 and what you remember of that day? Um, and so you know, incidents that get repeated a lot tend to become stronger memories. But what's weird hmm. is they often also mutate. And my memory. I'm pretty sure I was eating corn pops that morning. <laughs> it could have been corn flakes, is but that it, what you're saying? It could have been, yeah. Um, and that is another strange, funny thing about memory, is that over time, as these memories get reactivated, uh, they have a tendency to become something different from what actually happened. And there's no way to test that. Sure there is. Well, I mean, there's a way to test it if you're, I guess, if you're remembering a scene that is documented somehow, but in your memory of... And there are lots of great studies that have done that. Really? Yeah, oh, sure. Because in your memory of, you know, your breakup scene with somebody... Right, that could be totally fabricated. Right, but that's 10 years later, but you know it's what? a whole different... I think the fact that that happens is probably says something, I mean, says, is useful to us. Like, we're always creating this narrative about our lives, and that narrative is what keeps us sane, it what gives our lives meaning, mm -hmm. and sometimes uh, that narrative has to not align with what actually happened 
So we could cope with our lives. Yeah. Sometimes um, it's healthy to, yeah. to, to, to misremember. Right. Um, so in, in your training, you hit something called the OK Plateau. And um, I ba basically, this is when you're training and you're training, and you hit this spot where you're not getting any better. And you're not getting any better, and you're not getting any better, and you're putting all this work into it, and it's really frustrating. Um, but you found a way through your training and the friends you were consulting to get out of it. And I'm, I'm wondering if that has applications to everybody's, you know, some, something that's frustrating in everybody's life when you're trying it for something and you're not getting to where you want to be. You've hit a plateau. And can you explain how you kind of revved yourself out of that? Uh, so one of the reasons that I think I ended up being able to like come, come and compete in that contest and win it within a year was because I had really become obsessed with this whole field of psychology that studies experts and how experts get to be experts. Um, what, yeah, right. uh, how people acquire skill and get to be really good at whatever it is that they get to be really good at. And there's a whole, whole field of psychology that studies this, and it's really fascinating stuff. And one of the things that they found is that when people, one of the things that differentiates top performers from uh, people who are sort of the next grade down is that top performers put themselves in situations where they are regularly failing. Uh, they sort of take themselves outside of their comfort zone and practice in that space outside of their comfort zone. So it's more fun if you're learning how to play the piano to play songs when you sit down and play songs that like come out sounding great. That's <laughs> wonderful. That feels terrific. Yeah. But that's actually not a great way to get better at piano. If you want to get better at piano, you have to be practicing the parts of the pieces that you really can't do and practicing them in a deliberate way where you are watching yourself fail and learning from that failure. And what I tried to do with like memorizing decks of playing cards was come up with ways to force myself to do it faster than I knew I could. And over time, you start to recognize consciously, unconsciously, the things that are holding you back. And I think that that is a useful principle just for, for like, just kind of everything. Yeah. If you want to get better at something, you've got to make yourself uncomfortable. Um, which, you know. Which is unpleasant. Yeah, it doesn't come naturally. To and that's another thing for schools, right? I mean, uh, it's, it's much more fun to take a test or when, you're, when students are studying at home. There's, uh, you, you see this with the study skills of uh, better students versus worse students. Uh, worse students tend to ask themselves the questions that they get right because it feels great to get the que those questions right, but they're not, getting, they're not learning new material unless they're forcing themselves to study the stuff that they don't already know. Um, we're going to open it up for questions in just a minute if you guys have any questions. Um, uh, and I'm just wondering, so, you know, a few nights after the World Championships, you've won this huge thing that you've studied, you know, a year for, and you go out for dinner with friends. It's the end of the night. You take the train home. You're going into your house. Put the key in the lock, only to realize suddenly that you drove to the event. <laughs> No, I'm trying to, what does that say about the US Memory Championships? Or yeah. what does that say about you? I don't know, I'm just asking. So I didn't have to include that in the book. <laughs> but True. Uh, it does say something about the Memory Championships and about this kind of memory training. The thing that I kept coming away from the research that I was doing surprised by, and I ended up reading not only all the memory treatises written in, in Latin in translation, from 2,000 years ago, but all the way through the Middle Ages, uh, lots of writings about memory. And one of the things that was constantly surprising is how much they understood about cognitive science without having the jargon to express it in. Hmm. One of the things they talk about is this difference between natural memory and artificial memory. And natural memory is like the memory that we kind of walk around with, that we're born with, that we, you know, is always operating. And artificial memory is what you're able to do with that natural memory using techniques and practice and technique, uh, to essentially use it more efficiently. And that's what I was studying how to do, and that's what I was applying in this memory contest. But I'm sorry to say, training your artificial memory doesn't necessarily 
have ancillary benefits to your natural memory. Um, Damn. So memory techniques only work if you apply them. And you can be the kind of person who applies them and who, who uses them regularly. But I still forget to put the toilet seat down. <laughs> so has it made a difference for you? I mean, has the stuff that you've learned in your training and in the competition, have you been able to, is it so separate in your natural memory, your artificial memory, um, is it so separate that really it just was a lark and you're done with it, the book is done, blah, blah, blah? Or has it had like some applications that you've been able to I'm, I am now use? persona non grata in Las Vegas. <laughs> um, beyond that, you know, there are, in the, there are specific contexts in which memory techniques are extremely useful. Uh, they're extremely useful for remembering people's names. Uh, one of the places they are extremely useful, and this is really why they were invented, is for oratory and rhetoric. So when I give speeches now, I try, although not always, to do them from memory. Uh, using So instead of you know, reading off notes, I'm walking around some sort of a building in my mind. And it, then are there images or sentences there? Ah, great question. Uh, I follow, there was a great debate about this uh, that goes back to of course. Um, the, the Latin memory treatises. I follow Cicero who says, don't try and remember a speech word for word. Instead, remember it point by point. Each of the things that you're going to talk about, each of the paragraphs, right. remember the topic Like sentence, a bullet point. A bullet point. And then be comfortable enough that you can improvise off of it, but that you've always got this roadmap. By the way, the phrase topic sentence comes from the Greek word topos, place, because that is a vestige from when people used to think about oratory in terms of these sorts of memory places. And another one of these vestiges, uh, in the first place, I, you know, this. In the second place, that's like oh. in the first place of your memory palace. Oh. And that's how people used to think about delivering oratory, of orating. So, huh. so can you memorize a speech? And yeah, yeah. Your memory well, you've got so many memory palli. Some of them, uh. some of them have kind of uh, got the weeds growing over them at this point, <laughs> I'm sorry to say. But, uh, but that's what this stuff was invented for. And, and it's incredibly useful for that. And I think that is one application that kids probably should be taught in school. Because it takes, doesn't take long to teach them. Right. And we learn how to write in school, but we don't really learn how to speak. Um, and that's kind of a lost lost. Skill. Even lawyers don't really get like oratory training right. in the classical sense. But it's a, it's a useful skill. Um, do we have any questions? Uh, Lots of questions. Uh, um, Danielle's going to come around with the microphone, so I'll let her choose, pick and choose who's going to. Hi, my, my question kind of triggered by the last panel with Isabel Wilkerson, who spent 10 years of her life talking to 1,200 people. And I'm, I'm curious if you've thought about what sort of memories are worth remembering. Not packs of playing cards. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll tell you, uh, I, I had two experiences in the process of reporting this book that spoke to exactly that question. Uh, I got to meet two of the most extraordinary individuals. One was a guy named Kim Peek. Uh, well, one was a guy named E.P., uh, known in the scientific literature as E.P. He had probably the worst memory in the world. He couldn't remember anything more than his most recent thought. And as a result, his life was essentially existed only in the very moment in which he was having that conversation with you right now. His memory was so bad he didn't even know he had a memory problem. Here's somebody with no memory at all. I also spent time with a guy named Kim Peek, who was the basis for Dustin Hoffman's character in the movie Rain Man. And he remembered pretty much, I don't want to say he remembered everything, but we sat and spent the day in the public library memorizing phone books, um, which is exactly as scintillating as it sounds. <laughs> and there have been several people like him that I talk about in the book. In other words, this guy S, who seemed to remember everything. And S was just as dysfunctional as Kim Peek. Kim Peek was dysfunctional. S was just as dysfunctional as E.P., the guy who remembered nothing, the guy who remembered everything. He couldn't hold down a job. 
He couldn't distinguish between the things that were worth remembering that weren't worth remembering. He couldn't read poetry because like everything was um, had to be tangible for it to make sense to him, or had to be concrete. Anything that was abstract didn't make sense to him. And he basically was a loser. Um, I mean, he couldn't do anything with himself except for memory stunts. And Borges wrote a story about a guy called Funus de Memorius, who is very, very similar to this character, S. And Borges says in the story, you know, we, the real thing that's going on when you think, thinking, what we call thinking, is not remembering. It's forgetting. It's making that decision about what is worth holding on to and what can be allowed to sort of wash past us. Talked a little bit about high school, and I'm a high school teacher. How do you think, uh, if you were to go back knowing what you know now, to what degree do you think that would have affected your long-term memory of the things that are currently seen as important that we teach in high schools? I think the thing that um, I would have, I don't know if I would have done it, because the system is set up so that this is not valued. Uh, but I, the thing that I should have done is when I was learning European history in 12th grade, I should have been going back and like figuring out exactly how each of the things that was happening in Europe related to the things that I had learned the previous year in US history, giving myself a chance to relearn that material in a different context and make new associations. This is stuff that good teachers naturally do, but as a student, I'm not going to get tested on that US history material. I can't invest my time in doing that. I've got to you know, pass the next test. Uh, but that test is kind of like, it's kind of pseudoscience if it's only testing what you remember at that point and not whether you're going to have any real long-term memory of it. So I don't know. I don't know if I would have been able to do that, though. Danielle's coming around. I'm just tying in, oh. making connections. How does, how does uh, making connections tie in to all this? It's, well, it's, what you just talked about before, like tying in the US history with yeah. European history, what was going on. You're talking about US history, and then somebody says, well, that, what was going on in Europe and Asia at that mm -hmm. time? And, uh, how does that tie in to all this? There's a great uh, paradox in psychology known as the Baker-Baker paradox. And it goes like this. If you tell two people, to remember the same word, Baker. And you tell one person, remember that there's a guy named Baker, capital B. And you say to another person, remember that there's a guy whose job is that he's a baker. And you come back to him at some point later on, and you say, do you remember that word that I told you about? The person who's told his name is Baker is less likely to remember the same word as the person who was told his profession is that he was a baker. Same word, different amount of remembering. Why? Because the name Baker has none of these connections. It doesn't, your mind, it's free floating, untethered. It's not linked up with all the other things in your mind. The common noun Baker, we know Bakers. Bakers wear funny white hats. Bakers smell good when they come home from work. We even know, we probably even know a Baker or two. And, or maybe not <laughs> anymore. Um, and, except for that guy from, whatever. Uh, <laughs> Bad joke. Uh, and so as a result, when we hear that piece of information, it gets linked in with all of these other memories floating in our minds. And that's what makes something stick. And that's what, uh, if we want to make things more memorable, that's what we have to do, is figure out ways to transform capital B bakers into lowercase b bakers. And that's the entire essence of what's going on in one of these memory contests at a fundamental level. Could you, could you comment on photographic memory? Photographic it memory? It seems not to fit into your paradigm of what? Photographic memory is a myth. Um, there is exactly one case in the scientific literature of somebody with a truly photographic memory, as in the ability to look at something, take a snapshot in their, in their mind's eye, and reproduce it at a later date. And most psychologists now doubt that study for a number of reasons. So. If there is somebody with a photographic memory in this room, a truly photographic memory, 
There are plenty of scientists who would love to speak to you, but nobody's yet been found. I am curious um, of, right here. Yeah. I'm curious how you alluded to earlier during your preparation and how others in the field prepare by including some sense of sensory deprivation. And so I'm wondering if that's unique to people who have all of their senses, slash, and or if there are studies that look at people who are deaf or hard of hearing given the compensation with visual spatial issues and whether their memories are superior to those with all senses. And just as a total tangent, I'm curious, is your degree in science and what's your background? Uh, I, so in terms of the first question about like the memories of people who are blind and deaf, I don't know actually too much about that. Um, so I don't want to speak out of place. My own background is I'm, uh, I studied evolutionary biology as an undergrad, but just as an undergrad, I don't have a PhD or anything. How do you forget what you learned? Where are you? Back here. Oh. How do you um, forget what you've already learned? You, well, you learned all this stuff for the test. Does right. So what's, what's, what's funny about these memory contests is truly you don't want to remember anything that you've memorized for one of these memory contests any longer than you have to. Because what is the point of knowing a string of a thousand numbers? Um, and so memory contestants have these strategies that they will employ to force themselves to forget what they've just learned. And in the case of the um, memory palaces, what they'll do is they will not re revisit that memory palace for months, weeks, months, as long as they possibly can to give those images time to fade. If there was something they wanted to remember for the long term, they'd go back and they'd revisit that memory palace. Um, but for one of these contests, that's actually, ironically, not the idea. That's not the point. But kind of hard to forget sometimes. Yeah, but you know, I mean, all there was, your, your, your mentor gave you advice to like open the windows and let the sunshine into the memory palace to, yeah, in order to clear it out. I, I think that's a little bit more metaphorical. Okay. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but a lot of memory contestants talk about doing that, of, 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 of walking through and making sure that the windows in their memory palaces are open, right. so that the spaces are lighted. This is actually stuff that you find in the medieval memory treatises as well, I'm talking about making sure that you know, this, your, your memory palace is a well-lighted space, that right. there's ample room to walk around in it, <laughs> um, that the, the rooms of your memory palace are su substantially different from each other, that they won't blend together in any way. So. Okay, well, we have time for maybe, uh, maybe two more, three more. Okay, one kind, of memory that, one kind of memory that astounds me is the memory of a professional musicians or accomplished musicians who can play, you know, dozens, hundreds of, uh, of pieces without cheap music. Mm -hmm. uh, is that memory different than the kind of memory, memory for words or pictures. This is something I talk about in the book, is the memory of experts. There is something about becoming a great musician that brings with it a terrific memory for music. There's something about becoming a great chess player that brings with it a terrific memory for chess games. In fact, uh, with chess, one of the best predictors of how good somebody's going to be at chess is measuring how good they are at memorizing chess boards. Uh, and why is that? This is actually, I'll take a brief tangent because it's pretty interesting. If you uh, show a chess board to a grandmaster, at a certain point in their development as a chess player, it becomes trivial to memorize a chess board. Uh, and they can typically remember games that they played long ago. Uh, sometimes they can even play games entirely in their mind's eye, multiple games at once. If you take that same chessboard and you rearrange the pieces, same number of pieces, same chessboard, but they're rearranged such that they couldn't have arrived that way through a real game, suddenly the chess grandmaster's memory is only slightly better than average. That's weird. What's going on there? Well, this board, the one that was played in a real game, has meaning, deep meaning, to the chess grandmaster. He's seeing structures. He's seeing 
strategies, re strategies yeah. relationships to previous games he's played, yeah. other games he's read about. It has this whole network of meaning uh, that is really the essence of understanding, the same essence of understanding that the musician has when he looks at a new piece of music. It means something different to him than it means to me. This chessboard might as well be noise. It's random. It has no meaning, and therefore it's not memorable. Okay, I think we have time for we, one. Yeah, we have time for one more. One more question. That's it. Yeah. Um, Michael Jackson, you said there was a connection between him and the Six of Clubs. And King I'm wondering of Hearts. If, if he was, oh, I'm sorry, Michael Jackson and the Six of Clubs. King of what, Hearts. What is the relationship between them? Is a person holding the card? And then no, the no, no, second. It's the King of Hearts, not the Six okay. of Clubs, but yeah. Well, how do you associate the number of the card with the actual image of a person or a balloon, et cetera? And then the other thing is, these techniques apply to learning a second language. Can they be used for that? Yes. OK, so the first answer to the first question, why does the King of Hearts mean Michael Jackson to me? It's kind of arbitrary. There's actually a little bit of meaning behind it, some symbolism. The Queen of Hearts, for what it's worth, is Janet Jackson. Um, but. I, at the risk of getting too deep into the esoteric of this, I won't give the full explanation. Uh, in terms of foreign languages, the main character in my book, this guy Ed Cook, who um, uh, studied cognitive science, uh, he actually dropped out of his PhD program uh, in part to start a website business, although it seems to be more of a nonprofit endeavor at this point, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> to use memory devices to learn foreign language vocabulary. Not foreign languages, because what's going on when you're learning a language is like vastly more complicated uh, than learning random words. But for learning foreign language vocabulary, it's kind of really cool. And, I, and you should check it out. It's called www.memrise.com. If you can take the 2,000 most commonly used words in Mandarin Chinese, and come up with some rich association, image, mnemonic, to help you remember those 2,000 words. And you won't speak Chinese, but you'll have a, uh, a leg up if you're walking around the streets of Shanghai. And <clears throat> from what I've seen of what he's doing, it's actually kind of, it's really fun, first of all. Uh, and I think has, could, could, could be effective. I don't know. Uh, check it out. Well, I think that's all we have time for. So thank you, Josh. Thank Ford. you.